Hi everybody, this is the lecture on writing the introduction. And this lecture is basically timed with working on your annotated bibliography or finishing it up. So as you're finishing up and have done your literature review, you can sort of think about it in terms of how it's going to bridge into your introduction. Uh, we won't write the introduction until a little bit later, about a week later or so, um, but it's good to keep that in mind at the moment. And so you might actually refer to this video also later when you write your intro draft, and also you might refer to this later when you do your full paper and you want to review that you've done all the things that you should do for the full paper. And so this will be a relatively quick lecture. So this is on writing the introduction of your paper. And for your paper, I recommend starting early and work progressively. Uh, so a number of you have already expressed concerns that you might be a procrastinator and you tend to put things off. Uh, that would be a very dangerous habit to continue in this class, as I think many of you have sort of recognized also already. Uh, so I would start writing early. And the worst thing that can happen if you start writing early is you finish early. You don't have to stress out about doing it at the last minute. Um, so that's a, that's a good position to be in. And if you start early and you have some problems, then you have some time to work them out in a sort of a calm fashion rather than to try to rush things. Uh, trying to rush things in writing is usually a disaster. And quite a bit of resources you can find for writing the paper is in chapter 11. And so um, specifically section 48 and section 49 referring to the introduction would also be very useful for you to look at. And so the structure of the paper overall is like this. And actually maybe I'm just going to show it to you. You can kind of see it visually. So if you look at 49, it's, uh, I don't know if it's a table or a figure, 11.3. Actually, it's, there's several figures here. That's kind of funny. Um, there's a series of figures with the paper here on the bottom of section 49 of your textbook. And uh, this is how your paper will look at the end. There'll be a, a title page, and we can talk about it a little bit more, but Basically, you can see that there's the uh, it's a brief summary of the title. You have the title, you'll have your name, and you have uh, Chafee College down here. Uh, I'm not super worried about the title page now. If you want to do a title page and work on it progressively, that's fine. Uh, but my guess is maybe you don't quite have a title yet for your paper, so that's fine for the introduction if you don't have a title or, or a working title. Uh, the abstract is the next page. The abstract is the summary of the research. And so I recommend that you write the abstract last. So the abstract summarizes your full paper. So you really can't write the abstract much at the moment because you haven't even analyzed your data yet. So the next part is the introduction. You can see here that there's a running head. Uh, going throughout the paper. We'll work on uh, those things as we go progressively through uh, the drafts of the paper. And then what we have here is there's the title. The title is centered in the introduction. You don't say introduction, you just have the title centered. See there's page numbers here. And then basically it's your introduction. And then there's the introduction is what we talked about before. We talked about the introduction quite a bit. The introduction is the conceptual basis for your study. So the introduction starts off with your research questions. You state your research questions. You let the reader know what the paper is about. Then the bulk of your introduction is a literature review where you review previous research articles on the topic, on the research questions. 
with a special part of that is building your arguments about the hows and whys. So your research, your research questions obviously have the relationship between at least two variables. So how and why are they related? So what are your arguments about why narcissism would be related to more aggression? That's the bulk of the introduction. The last part of the introduction is a specific statement of your specific hypotheses. And then we get to a very specific part of the paper, which is the method section, which we'll talk more about later in detail. Uh, but the method is basically how you got your data from who and your research design and your measurements. The next section is results. Results are your statistical analyses. And again, we'll talk about this. These, each part of the paper we're going to talk about in more detail as we get to it. And then the discussion is interpreting the data from your findings in relationship to the conceptual arguments that you made in your introduction. And this is why having a good introduction is so important because it's going to give meaning to your data. So if you have a shaky introduction, your discussion is going to be shaky too, and because of that, your paper is going to be pretty shaky. Uh, then you have your references sections. Uh, you know, do have that references section for your intro draft. I gave you a link to the references for your annotated bibliography. So if you use that link, the last link is especially good, but there's several links there. You can look at to see the format of the references in the references section. And then uh, oftentimes you'll have uh, figures and tables, and we'll talk about that later as we get more towards that. And also what I've done is in the PowerPoint of this lecture, I have a link to a sample paper uh, in APA style. It says uh, professional paper. What they really mean by professional paper, they mean uh, empirical paper like you're producing for this class of something that is reporting an empirical research study that collected data, analyzed those data. So we sort of already talked about the format of the introduction. You want to center the title of the paper. I know that's going to be a working title for your intro draft, so don't worry about having a final uh, paper. Uh, you have a running head. Uh, so you can see the examples up here. So you can look at section 49 for the running head, but also that sample paper with that link there also has an example of a running head. Um, you might be able to see it more clearly with that link there on the the second thing there. Um, so you can look at that for the details and we basically just talked about the structure of the introduction just now. So remember the introduction, you start off and the whole paper is an hourglass. And so the introduction is um, goes a little bit general. It starts with the research questions. You get a little bit more specific with the literature review. You get very sp more specific, I should say, with the hypotheses. And then the method section, because it's details about how you got your data, that's very specific, so very narrow for the hourglass. The results is very narrow also because it's your specific data and your specific statistics. And then in the dis discussion, it gets more broad. So the discussion starts off uh, a little bit more broad. It tries to say how your data, your findings, whether they support your hypotheses or not, then it tries to interpret those data, those findings, using the conceptual stuff from the introduction. So it's broadening. And the last part of the discussion is very broad in the sense that you're making suggestions for future research. Uh, so it's an hourglass. And so the introduction starts off a little bit broad, gets a bit more narrow, gets a bit more narrow. So again, the introduction, the structure of it is first paragraph, state your research questions and why they're interesting, important to look at. And then the, the main part, the body of the introduction is the literature review. Here you should probably start off with definitions of your variables. So make sure you give definitions of your variables because that way the reader will understand specifically what you mean by the terms that you use. And this, of course, is based on previous literature. And it gets a little bit more broad because then you want to have the meat of it 
the meat of it is your conceptual arguments, the hows and whys. Why is narcissism related to aggression? What's the argument there, the conceptual argument? And so that's the meat of things. And then uh, once you have those arguments down, those arguments then lead to specific hypotheses about how the variables are related to each other. So that's the structure of the introduction. Section uh, 48 of your textbook is pretty good about general writing style for APA. Uh, so in terms of your paper, you're writing for somebody who's an educated person but doesn't know your topic. So this is why I was saying things like you want to define your variables because you can't assume that somebody knows what you're talking about if you say preoccupied attachment. You need to define that. So when you're writing, the big thing about writing is making your thinking explicit. Uh, oftentimes students, I think, either they think something and uh, they kind of write it between the lines or they think, um, oh, the professor should know this. And so I'll just kind of say this and I think the professor knows what I'm saying. You don't assume that. Um, so all of your thinking should be very explicit, specific. Uh, shouldn't be telegraphic. There should be uh, links between your ideas. They should be spelled out. One way I could say to um, improve this before you turn it in is to have somebody read your paper draft out loud to you. Because sometimes when we're writing, we're just concentrating on what we're writing, and sometimes we're kind of thinking something, but it doesn't go on paper. Um, I shouldn't say paper. It doesn't go on the document. But if we have somebody read our paper out loud to us, sometimes we're like, oh my gosh, that sounds weird. I forgot to say this. I should have said this. I can make this connections. So I highly advise that you have somebody read your paper out loud to you so you can hear how it sounds, so you can avoid that telegraphic writing. APA style, use first person, please. Uh, first person is allowed in APA style. It's actually encouraged in APA style if it helps you avoid passive language. So you know sometimes uh, you may have taken some writing courses and they told you you can't use the first person. Um, that's actually wrong. So um, one, it's wrong. Two, you know probably when you ha had to write under that constraint of not using the first person, you had some weird sounding sentences because you're doing all these weird things to try to avoid the first person. So typically when you're doing all of those calisthenics to avoid first person, you end up with a very passive, uh, indirect language. Uh, so in science, we want direct, straightforward language. So use first person, especially if it helps you avoid that type of weird sounding sentences. Uh, you want to obviously be writing in a formal way, but uh, it should be simple, clear, and straightforward. Uh, sometimes people get into trouble because they think they need to sound like a scientist and they have a weird idea, perhaps, of what a scientist sounds like, and it sounds uh, kind of strange, the writing. Uh, use simple, clear, straightforward language. Uh, your sentences in relationship to this should be short and direct. Uh, they shouldn't be really long um, and go on and on. Uh, be short and direct. Uh, sort of same thing for your paragraphs. Each paragraph should some, have some sort of idea. You cover the idea well. You make your argument about the idea. Then you make a transition to something else in the next paragraph. Um, so having uh, a little bit of shorter paragraphs is better than longer paragraphs. I'd say if you have a paragraph that's Getting to be a, a three-quarters of a page to a page long is probably too long of a paragraph. So the writing is crisp. The way I like to kind of say it is like you're jabbing. It's like bam, 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 bam. Here's a point, bam. Here's a point, bam. Here's a point, bam. So you're really direct. And this is including the structure of your paragraphs. Avoid jargon. What does jargon mean? So avoid the sort of using big terms to try to sound scientific. 
course, you should be using terms like preoccupied attachment, narcissism, things like that, that are your variables. But avoid uh, trying to say, oh, I have to use some really big words here. I want to sound smart. I want to sound scientific. No. Uh, try to avoid that jargon, uh, those types of weird terms that are uh, actually quite vague in the end. Again, keep things simple, straightforward, and clear. Avoid biased language. So if you look at section 48 in your textbook, uh, it goes over this, uh, including table 11.1 .1 in section 48. Uh, do look at that. Uh, there's also some online resources that can help your general writing. That's, those are given in section 48 of the textbook. And then when we're thinking about writing the introduction, we have in-text citations. So I already gave you an example of references, so the references section, but in-text citations are in your writing. Um, so they would look like this. So if you have two authors, it would look like this, and then the year of the publication. In general, I recommend don't doing this because I think when people write in this way, emphasizing authors, it starts sounding like a book report. This person said this, and then this person said this, and then this person said this. Generally, that's not good writing style because really the introduction is you. The introduction is not a book report about what other people said. The introduction is what's your arguments about your own research. They are based on previous research, but the, the names of the authors are not the important things. The ideas are the important things. So I would recommend something like the second one where the idea comes out clearly. So I would recommend in general that you keep the author's names in parentheses. And so in this case, you have it in parentheses, the author's names, there's an ampersand in between the two names, comma, the year of the publication. Again, putting the author's names in parentheses will help you emphasize the ideas and help make the arguments your own course, based on previous research, rather than it sounds like you're just simply puking up somebody else's arguments. Uh, by the way, if you have three or more authors on an article or on a citation, it would be the first author's last name, et al, period, here, comma, 2008. If you had it up here, it would be Jones, et al, period, parentheses, 2008. So three or more authors you use at all, and you do that immediately in a new APA style. You don't, you don't have to have a citation with all of them. You can start with the at all at the very first time you cite it in your text, in your narrative. This is a, a table I took from the book, which I think is very good in terms of general writing style. Uh, so APA features very few direct quotations of other researchers. So uh, here they talk about the scientific value. So uh, these phenomena and theories are, are objective. They're, they're not a property of the people. So that's the scientific thing. Um, for me, I want you to avoid direct quotes because, I, again, I want you to make the introduction your own. So I already talked about this don't have the um, authors be the emphasis in a sentence. Put the authors in parentheses. I said to do that because I want you to make the arguments your own. Same thing here. Avoid those direct quotations because you want to make the arguments your own. Uh, criticisms are directed at other researchers' work, but not them personally. That should be a, a relatively um, simple thing. Um, so it's about ideas, it's not about people. And again, we live in this historical age in America where we don't see this a lot. We see people attacking other people rather than evaluating ideas, uh, which is, I think is a horrible uh, trend that we have in our country. Um, and maybe we can learn something from scientific writing here that ideas are the things, not people. Um, it says here there are many references and reference citations. So all I'll say is that you should have references and citations. I don't know about what many means, 
Uh, and I'm sure if you think that, you might think, oh, how many do I need? Well, when there is something that you got from another person's work, you cite it, you reference it. Um, so uh, have references for those things that you learn from other people. I think that's a good way of sort of putting that. Empirical research reports are organized with specific sections in a fixed order. So this is actually the, the sections in the main sections of the paper that we just went over actually shows the process of research. So the introduction is the first section. So the first process of your research is trying to think about what your research question is. What's the general research question? Then you did your lit review. So you did your lit review, so you want to summarize the lit review, and then based on the lit review, you're going to have your conceptual arguments about what's going on, uh, how the variables are connected with each other, why one thing influences another thing, and then that lit review leads to specific hypotheses. Then when you have your specific hypotheses, then you can think about your research design, which is the method section, so how you get your data. So you get your data, you do your research, you have your research design, that's part of the method. That's the next section. The next section is results. So you did your research, you collected your data, well, analyze them, do the statistics. That's the results. The next step is, well, what do these data mean? That's the discussion. So the research report actually mirrors the process of research itself. And we talked about this last point, um, but basically researchers um, hedge their conclusions. So we say things such as uh, the results suggest. We don't say uh, this proves. This study proves that. No, uh, the, res the results suggest that. So uh, we know that uh, research is uh, tentative in a sense that it's a, it's a current way of understanding things. Uh, we never have the final answers. That's the biggest point. Smaller points are we know that we need other researchers examining similar research questions using different methodologies, et cetera, to see if they sort of say the same thing about the research question before we can even say that um, there's, a, there's a decent amount of evidence that something's going on here. So uh, science is tentative and uh, is, um, how to put it, I would say science is confidently Give me a second here. Uh, I, was, I was digging for a word. Confidently modest. It's, that's not, that might sound weird that they don't go together. Um, confident in the sense that we, if we follow the rigors of research, um, there's something objective there. There's something that we can hang our hat on, if you will, that something is there. But also we're very modest. We don't want to uh, say that for sure this is happening, that we know everything. And definitely this is the um, difference between science and pseudoscience, like we talked about before. Pseudoscience people are 100%, they know everything about everything. And anybody that disagrees with them is wrong or stupid. Um, science isn't that way. Uh, science is confident in our methodologies and our approach, but we're also very modest about our conclusions and what we know about the world. Uh, so these things should come out in the writing style also of your paper. And I think this is it. Uh, so that's the lecture on reviewing, I'm sorry, lecture on uh, talking about writing your introduction. Uh, so you again uh, should look at this for the next exam uh, and in relationship to thinking about your annotated bibliography and maybe start thinking a little bit about writing your introduction, some drafts of it. Uh, we will talk more about writing the introduction drafts a little bit later. And also, you might watch this video um, when you write your draft a little bit later. And also when you complete your full paper, because it might be useful to re-listen to this when you have your full paper draft to make sure you're sort of hitting these points. Uh, so I'll talk to you in the next lecture.